It was, it was awesome for a 10-year-old. And I was like, holy shit, I was thrilled. And his wife, Ann Edkins, goes, I don't believe you got a 10-year-old boy a pellet gun. He goes, what the fuck, does he have to be 25 years old to have a pellet gun? <laughs> He just used to give that woman the hardest time. He was like 120 pounds. He used to go to the Dominion Tavern, pick fights with everybody. Pick fights with everybody. They'd, they'd, they'd grab him under an arm, kick him up, <laughs> carry him outside. Jimmy, go home. Go home now. I'll beat that bastard's ass. <laughs> I'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. He had this tree like chestnuts. Remember we used to get chestnuts? Yeah, chestnuts across the So I fell out of the tree and I was like four or five years old. I don't know. I was young. I don't think I was ever in school, so I must have been like four or five. So I found a tree and I was crying, you know, and, and I was like 10 feet up the tree and he goes, Oh, shut the hell up. You're only 10 feet up. You ain't at 40 feet up in a fucking tree. You're five years old. You're dead to be crying. Get the hell up here. <laughs> Hurry up. He was on the porch, you know, yelling at me. You know, you believe in Santa Claus, you know. So he took us to... Uh, he, so mom ended up having Christmas at their house because they had a like, like a chimney, you know, a fireplace and stuff. So I, I wanted a dump truck, like one of these yellow Tonka dump trucks. And, and I guess Uncle Jimmy and Aunt Agnes got the gift, and it was like a fire truck. Yeah. And I opened up the thing, and it was a fire truck. And I started crying. And I said, I, said oh, I wanted a dump truck. I told Santa I wanted a dump truck. And he said, Well, you didn't tell him loud enough, did you? <laughs> Scarred me for life, man. And the one kid's name was Algy, and he was a big kid. And one day, I mean, he just hauled off, and he just nailed me. I mean, he just nailed me. He was twice my size. And I go down, and I'm, what, all this. And my, my mother comes out, and they lived on a second floor apartment. And she's standing here, you're like this. Yeah, bitch, yeah, you Ukrainian bitch. She says, you came in, you bloody bare feet. She says, I'm going to send you back to goddamn Ukraine or wherever you came from. I mean, she's screaming at them. I'm, Mom, Mom, you're making a scene. Wait, what happened when um, Dean got in a fight or something like that? Oh, no, that's the time Dean brought a kid home oh, what happened? to fight it, to fight it the house. Oh, yes, that's I told Dean, I said, you know, Dean said, this guy's been giving me a hard time. I said, Dean, you know what? You want to make sure it's a fair fight? Bring him home. Tell him to follow you home if he thinks he's so tough. You know, I'll be there to make sure that nobody interferes. So Dean brings him home. He says, yeah, he's out there in the front. I said, well, go out. Then Dean, go out there and kick his ass. And Dean proceeded to go out there and kick his ass. <laughs> and did he kick his ass? The kid's crying. And the kid who lived in the... Uh, Jimmy White. Okay, so Jimmy, the kid, yeah. like, he, like, beat up Dean or something. He, like, d d we were in a tree or something. He pushed Dean out of the tree. That's what it was. The, there was a tree like right in, on your side of the backyard. So um, your mom asks what happened, and she go, comes on and she goes, "He did what, hon?" And she and Dean told him Dean was crying and sobbing, and she asked me to have him. I said, "Yeah, Granny, he did do that." And yeah, so, he did do that. So Granny goes over, she knocks on the door, and what was the guy's name? The next to the neighbor? Oh, Jimmy White. Yeah. The the the, the son. Was Jimmy. Jimmy. Jimmy, get your son out here, no. <laughs> and she, 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 she comes to the door and he goes, go home, you're drinking or something like that. He goes, get your son out here or I'll take it out on you, Jimmy. <laughs> so I'm like, get your son out here, Jimmy. I'm not letting my son out. I'm not letting my son out. Then I'm taking She reached in. They had like those glass doors. Your mom reached in, grabbed him, and she was just like, smacking out of the chair. And I was this little kid still. Like, oh my God. Oh, wow. She was Jamie's He didn't take shit from anybody. And they're both little guys, but they were Fleischer. You know, they were both soldiers in the war and shit, you know. I remember when I was a kid, you know, they, they were shot in the beer guys, you know. Mm -hmm. Shot a scotch, bottle of beer. And I remember, they, I was little, I'd sit there watching you because I like being around them. Uh -huh. And they'd take the whiskey and go, I'd smell it. I'd go, that's terrible. they go, that's bloody good, son. And they'd go, <laughs> Remember their faces. <laughs> then they take the beer and chug. Good. Then why'd you make that face? <laughs> they were funny little guys. Feisty. Uncle Alec, you couldn't drive down the street if, if there was if you saw an Asian person ahead, make a U turn. He was he was captured by the Japanese. He lived as a you know in the jungle for eighteen months. He thought it was so funny, he thought he they stabbed him in the back with a bayonet six times. The Jap did. You know he still had the holes in his back. 
I mean, he, when he came from Scotland, he stayed with our family until he could find a job and find a house. And so I had twin beds in my bedroom, so he would sleep in my bedroom. And he'd wake up during the night, you son of a bitch, shoot the pasta! You know, and I'd be, Uncle Alex, calm down, calm down. I mean, he would wake up. Wait, you know, no, tell the story nightmares. when he was in, in Burma. The whole family thought he was dead. Oh, yeah, they, the, they, had, a, they had a funeral. The knees, right? They had a funeral for him. They, they had buried him. And then 18 months later, he shows up at the door. <laughs> Well, I heard that, they, that like his platoon was pinned down. Oh, they—they they, they were massacred right there on the beach. But he made it into the jungle. This is like, your, this is your relative. Uh, well, one of the uncles. Months. Eighteen months. Yeah, wait, he was, he wait. He was highly decorated. He went and he, he was rescued by the, the Burmese native people who also hated the Japanese. Right. And so they would go. He figured he was never going to get out, so he just went out at night because he saw his buddy's machine gun down. He figured he was going to die out there, so he went out with the Burmese people every night. They'd go out to kill Japs. And uh, oh man, he, he showed me some of the tactics they used. He once showed me. He said, "He said uh, I can immobilize you with a broomstick and a piece of rope this big." I said, "Well, I don't see how." He tied my wrists together, <laughs> slid them over like this, and stuck a broom right here like that, and then tipped me on my side. And I, he said, "That's why they used to catch in Japanese." And then they used to tell him in Japanese, uh, you know, and they tie their mouth up and tell him. We'll be back in a couple hours. We're gonna cut your head off. <laughs> you know, tell them we're gonna kill you when we come back. You know, and they every night they kill Japanese soldiers. And the, it got back to British intelligence. They didn't know who's doing all the damage back there in the jungle. They didn't know who was doing it. Wow. It was him and these Burmese people. But they taught him how to do things. He taught them how to do things. They used to take a little piece of rope and tie two knots in it, about this long, and they'd come up behind you, flip it over your head, and pull it like you're stuck on a lawnmower, and it would cut both jugular veins. Yes, I mean, wow. he was a lethal little guy. I mean, he was, he was and that scary. was Granny's brother? Well, yeah. who was the one who crawled on their hands and knees? Uh, that was that's him. He crawled up the beach. The, they got landed on the beach or walked into the water, and all of a sudden the beach lit up with machine guns. That's right. And all his buddies. And they were um, going down, they were taking their watch, as Mom said, and they yeah. turned his watch, yeah, and they stabbed were, him, and he Yeah, they were him. crawling on the crawling on, right. the, on the sea and trying to make it into the jungle right. to get away from the machine gun fire. He made it, but nobody else did. 600 of them. But well, Mom told me about one of the circumstances. He was, they're like, the tomb was pinned down and they were going to get overrun, and he crawled on his hands and knees to uh, well, another. That was the Uncle Willie. She went okay, so Uncle Willie. Uncle Willie ben crawled on his hands and knees and got rescued them, got to another British platoon, and they came back and massacred the people that were coming in and rescued. The, uh, they got all of them. That's probably Uncle Willie. That was Uncle Willie. Okay, so he was decorated. He had a... Yeah, yeah. The cross yeah. from the Queen. The yeah. Queen Victoria 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 Cross. Cross. Right. Yeah. He, he saved the whole platoon. This is Granny Sandy family. They're good warriors. Black Watch. They were fearless. They were they just called? fearless. They were little Except guys. My kids don't know. No, we relate to Robert the Great. That was our clan. Scotland, we're all related at one point or another. Again, like I said, incest is a game the whole family can play. Incest is best, right. relatively speaking. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no, oh, I, saw, I don't really want to talk horrible. about this. She was a maniac, that woman. Just a maniac. Remember the pool she had, that big pool? Yeah, remember oh, yeah. she used to like us to all go watch, go naked? We didn't realize it back then, but that was kind of strange, eh? She did? <laughs> yeah. That's strange, eh? So did you? She wanted us to go naked? Did you? Yeah, remember? Did you? Mm-mm. Yeah, I was a little kid. I didn't know. I was like a little kid. And Billy and, and Billy and Brian did not like Billy. <laughs> Billy and Barry. Oh my God, he Barry. Was such an alcoholic. Oh, did I tell you I saw Barry like 25 years ago? I hadn't seen him in 10 years. He's just in his early 30s, and he had the big red nose and all that shit. I mean, he looked like he was 60, and he was like 30. Uncle Sam was such a great guy. Uncle Sam was terrific. I loved him. Oh, I don't Maria. remember any of these people. Women loved him. He was a, he would who sing. Who was Uncle Sam? Beautiful he's blue who eyes. I was named That's after. Yeah, blue yeah soft blue eyes. Um, How he was is he related? A, he's a handsome man. He's, he's great. His brother. brother. He was the youngest brother. Uncle he was the youngest Sam. of all the boys. That's who he was named after. That, yeah, I'm called after Uncle Sam. But he was a drummer and a singer in a band. And uh, so he'd play in, in clubs at night. And Isa, his wife, got so jealous. That was Isa's husband? Isa's Isa husband. Isa played the guitar, too, in, his yeah. ba- in the band. And, oh, and, yeah. Yeah, but then he threw her out of the band because she stunk. <laughs> and uh, the other band member said, your wife's got to go. She, she has no talent. And uh, But because he was playing in, he was playing in the, the Metropole when it was a big club in, in Windsor and... and uh, so, you know, at the end of the night, there's all kinds of young girls hitting on him, and eyes just got, she'd go berserk. She would just go nuts. She always thought she was a lesbian. One, one night she walked in, she was dead drunk, 
took, he was asleep, she takes lighter fluid, squirts it all over the bed and throws a lighter on it. Lights the bed on fire, almost burned the house down. That's Uncle Sam, you know. How do you stay with her so long? Yeah, how, so how do you stay going. with this one? He did it for the kids, for Billy and David, so for his boys. So uh, what's Billy the doing? sex was crazy. I have no idea. I'm he like, told this one have anything to do with anybody. Maureen told me, like, she'd seen him. And uh, somebody else tried to fight him. He had a bird by Mom tried to fight him. Remember his room? I remember being upside in, uh, upstairs in his room. Oh, it was like a bird. Oh, yeah, she beat the hell out of A monsoon here, something. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, he's, he's, like he's got the story. He's got the ball in the backyard. So I throw the ball at him. He felt it was too hard. It hit him, and he started crying. And he, I'm, what's the matter with you? He's crying. It's all a bunch of kids playing together. And he goes, you're nothing but a dirty railroad tramp like your mother and father. I went, what? So I, I went up and I nailed him, you know. So he goes screaming, you know, but, back home and his mother comes in the kitchen and corners me. They, were, they lived across the street. Well, no, but hey, Uncle Jimmy was having a party at his house. It was some occasion. That's why all the kids were together. That's why we were all out there. And uh, and Isaac comes. She's got me cornered in the kitchen saying, what did you, you hurt my son. You hurt, what did you do to Barry? And, and wait, Norma, no, and Granny it, was little. It, oh, and yeah. Isa was it's huge. Yeah, she was granny big, was petite. She looked like a big butch looking woman. Yeah. And, uh, she was born, she was and Norma, Norma, you know, her mother's sister your sister um, too my sister too came in the kitchen and she saw that i was cornered she went out and told my mother she said isis got sam and cornered in the kitchen and you know and my mother came in and saw that she she's interrogating me and my mother just went off on her just <laughs> attacked her oh, attacked her knocked her over the coffee table like <laughs> <laughs> she did Family and she was just like you know <laughs> she was 80 pounds soaking wet she's a little yeah. blonde haired blue eyed yeah. thing about this big you know but uh, boy, did she have a temper. She got the, she had the same temper as her brothers, you know. I remember they got into one. I was hiding under the table. They got into a rough one, and you know, Isa was drunk or something. Something happened. I think one of the kids or something. And she grabbed Isa by the and she had Isa by the hair, and she was smacking her and punching her and smacking. Her. <laughs> and I was hiding under the table. I was so scared of it all. And I, yeah. I'd never seen anything like that, you know. Grady was very protective of, of, of the kids. Don't yeah. pass it with the kids. That was God. That's fifty years ago. I mean, they were all they were all feisty, but Granny was the, tough. The, but but the, the, she the, was the crowning too. the crowning thing was when Uncle Alec's sons came over from Scotland, Alec and William. Oh yeah. And I mean, nobody had a bigger impact on my teenage life than my cousin Alec. I mean, I was thirteen. This guy comes from Scotland. He's sixteen. Okay. And he's got long hair. It was that was with the mods, okay, were for the thing in England, you know, the bell bottom pants and all this. Mm -hmm. He comes over. He's got this long hair. He's wearing sandals, bell bottom pants, you know, look kind of goofy to us, you know. But you know what I know? I was 13 years old, and uh, and so all the family's there because they had just got from Scotland that day, and and from the airport, everybody picked them up, and so they're all drinking and celebrating, and so, you know, I said to my cousin Alec, I said, Alec. Do you like fishing? Maybe we can get out of here. He says, yeah, oh, yeah, I like to go fishing. I said, well, the river's right here. Come on, we'll go down to the river and we'll go fishing. We'll get out of here and let them. So he goes, oh, okay. So we're walking down, going down to the river, and here comes, I was telling Aaron this story today, the toughest guy in our neighborhood was called Ken Nada, and Ken Nada was a big grease ball. You know, he wore a leather jacket. Um, he had no front teeth. You know, he had chains and all this shit, tattoos, like hate on his knuckles. And everybody was afraid of him. He was 18 years old, you know, and everybody lived in fear of Ken Nada. But not me, because he used to drink with my Uncle Jimmy and that. So I was like a little brother. I used to tell guys, you know, hey, don't screw with me. I'm a, I know Ken Nada, you know. <laughs> and so Ken was a good guy as far as I was concerned. So here I am walking with my 16-year-old cousin who just got here from Scotland. And we're walking down the river, and I said, oh, Alec. Here's somebody, this is an important guy for you to meet. You gotta meet Ken Nada. And and you know, I'm, Ken's being nice. I said, Ken, I want you to meet my cousin Alec. You just got here from uh, Scotland today. And Ken goes, Oh, great, you know, he shakes his hand, he goes, Hey, listen, if anybody fucks with you, you just tell him you know me. And my cousin Alec looks at him and goes, Wham! And suckers him. He goes down on the ground, he puts his foot in his throat, he says, No, if anybody fucks with you, you tell him you know me. <laughs> I went, holy shit, <laughs> my cousin just beat the shit out of the toughest guy I know, <laughs> you know, so, so oh my God. this, this became a continuing saga, the, the prettiest girl in our neighborhood, her name was Susan Dresser, everybody had the hots for her, 
and she was going out with a guy, Peter McLean, who was a friend of mine. He, okay, he's he's at, he's 14 years old, but he's got a nickname, Jesse. Okay, when you're 14 years old, you got a nickname. You're a tough guy. Okay? <laughs> Jesse was tough, and he was dating Susan Dresser. Well, she met my cousin Alec. He was a good-looking guy, and she was just she dropped Jesse like that. So. So, but he, everybody, the word had gotten out what he did to Ken Nata, so nobody really wanted to push him. So, Ken, so Jesse calls Susan up and he says, yeah, I heard uh, your Scottish boy Alec gave you crabs. And she starts crying and she calls my cousin Alec. You know what he said to me? Alec goes, I'll be right over. <laughs> he comes to my house. What does this Jesse love? I said, well, wait a minute, Alec. Right now, him and his big brother Guy and all his big brother's buddies are down at the schoolyard, they're playing basketball. There's about 10 of them. I said, you better wait. Bullshit. Down he goes, by himself. Walks into the schoolyard. Who's Jesse? <laughs> Jesse goes, me. Walks up, grabs him by the hair, and starts kicking him in the face in front of his big brother and all his buddies. And they now they realize, they're all going, yeah, that's a crazy guy from Scotland. <laughs> and none of them did anything. They all sit there and watch. And, he comes back to my place, and here comes the police car, and that was his first arrest, okay? <laughs> he had to pay rest $800 for dental work for Jesse. Oh, that was um, so much money uh, back uh, then. Assault charge. Wow. Every month, the police were picking him up. My pellet gun that I was so proud of that my my uncle bought me for, for Christmas, on the river, we decide, Alec decides he's going to rent a rowboat, okay? So we're going to go fishing. He said, oh, bring that pellet gun of yours. <laughs> We're going fishing. What do we need a pellet gun for? Just bring the bloody gun. Okay, so I bring the pellet gun. So we're rowing down the river, and here's, you know, the black guys are all up there, and they have those, like, big deep-sea fishing rods, and they, whoosh, they can throw this line way the hell out there. So the line goes from the shore all the way out into the river, okay? And then they attach a little bell to the rock. And when a fish bites, the bell starts ringing, and they wind it in. So we're rowing, and Alex turns the boat. Now we're heading close to where all these guys' fishing lines go in the water. He goes, watch this, watch this. He's <laughs> laughing. And one of the guys' bell starts ringing. Alec grabs the line, goes like this, cuts the line, pulls the fish up, and goes, hey, thanks for the fish. Oh <laughs> so he drops the fish in the boat. Well, they proceed to grab rocks. They start throwing rocks at us. Alec goes, give him the goddamn pellet gun. <laughs> he's, boom, boom, and he's shooting at them. Now they're running for their cars, and he's shooting. <laughs> Here comes the police car. Sirens on the shoreline. Bring the boat in. <laughs> Alec goes, bullshit. We'll row to Detroit. I'm going, I'm not rowing to Detroit. We're going to turn ourselves in. They it's took my pellet gun. They, so I lost my pellet gun. I mean, he. I was constantly in trouble. My first my first appearance in court was because of him. I mean, <laughs> my, my bar mitzvah album, don't you? That's, that's I, don't think Alec, I don't think Alec was there. I think that was William. He was not a good looking guy. He was taller and thinner than Alec. Alec was, you know, built. Um, William was a very quiet guy, never opened his mouth, didn't say shit, didn't say a word. You couldn't get him to talk. Went to work every day, worked hard. Um, I, I just thought he was the sweetest guy. One day Alec borrowed his car. Now, think about this. I think Alec's the toughest guy on the planet. Okay? And Alec does something to William's car. Alec's going, Wait, so oh, who, shit. who are they related oh. to them? What? They're your first cousins, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Their uncle Alex. Their, their father was the war and, hero, right? Yeah, he was yeah. a war hero. And so uh, I'm saying to Alec, what are you so worried about? He says, because of what I did to William's car. I said, well, why are you worried? He said, oh, William will beat the shit out of me. <laughs> what? <laughs> you're the toughest guy I've ever met. And, and your your quiet brother is going to beat the shit out of you? He said, oh, William's. He, Alec, who's a crazy man, says to me, William's fucking crazy. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Holy shit. Who are these guys? <laughs> you know? Glasgow was supposed to be really tough. Yeah, it was very tough. He was 16 years old when he came. He had knife wounds. He had a, uh, right here on his neck where he was slashed with a straight razor. He had a scar on his face where he was hit with a broken bottle. I mean, at 16 years old. Wow. He looked like he'd, you know, been through Stalingrad. Alec got some girl pregnant. He goes out. He was just a crook, you know. He goes out. He gets um, new washer and dryer, refrigerator. A new car, <laughs> gets all kinds of stuff on credit, sells it all to some guy for like 20 cents on the dollar, takes the money, goes back to Scotland. So, so we still have relatives in Scotland. Pardon me? 
We still have relatives in Scotland? Yeah, but I don't know anybody. Your mother was the only contact I ever had. If I ever wanted to go back and well, no, meet no, our family. Norman. Yeah, Norman's dad. Uncle Norman said that he uh, notified all your relatives in Scotland and oh, Australia. Okay. Or Austria. Australia. Australia. Yeah, that's the animal. Oh, yeah, and we have some really wealthy relatives in Australia, right? I don't know if they're wealthy or not. Yeah, they Mom said, Mom said they? they had like a big mansion or something. That's Aunt Emma. Okay. My mother loved her. How many How many brothers and sisters did your mom have? There was dad 11, have? 11 kids, seven, seven girls, side? four boys. Hmm? And your he dad? He was a sergeant major in the British Army and, and served in India in the days of like Gunga Din, you know, and that. Oh, and I story. used to tell stories how he, uh, uh, he and the soldiers would sit on the side of the mountain and the Maharajas would have a parade. And the elephants would be covered in rubies and diamonds and all that, and the sun would be glistening off of them. And they used to watch these parades going by. He said it was absolutely incredible. He loved India. If it wasn't for marrying, you know, your great grandmother, he would have. Uh, he said he would have gone back to India and stayed there forever. Tell me the story about the guy that raped the. Uh... Oh yeah, that him. Some of his uh, uh, Indian, native Indian guy raped this uh, little white girl. So him and some of the soldiers. They found out who he was, they caught him, they took him out in the jungle, tied a rope around his neck, he just, <laughs> like that left him hanging there to choke to death. A lot of murders trained, in our family. He trained a real famous, uh, his name was Bombardier Wells. He was a boxer. Boxer, trainer. yeah, Bombardier Wells. And he trained Bombardier Wells. Bombardier Wells was the common champion. Who trained champion. him? And Elkie Clark. Elkie Clark, I But that was our, that was our, our great grandfather. He was a famous uh, boxing trainer. And, uh, and of course, the famous physical therapist. I'm 16 years old. You know what do I know? And um, that's way before cellular technology. If you had a phone in your car, it was uh, you like called a, a mobile operator. It was a black phone. So, and um, so Clarence had a car, and you know he was uh, he was the shooter then. He had this big Chrysler, and he had this phone in here. So their mother comes over with the kids, uh, you know, to see my mother, and they're going to spend the day, and I said, Mark, let me take your car for a ride. She goes, yeah, she throws me the keys, and she says, come back in a couple hours. I'm great, so I get this big Chrysler, I got this phone, I go and I pick up a bunch of my buddies. I told Tracy, I, I finally had the yearbook out, trying to figure out who else I could call. <laughs> I'm calling everybody, everybody. Yeah, mobile operator, yeah, dial this number. And I'm, hey, guess who I'm calling from? I'm calling from a car. No <laughs> shit, yeah. Put so yeah, Bobby's here. Yeah, let me talk to Bobby. So I'm doing this, you know, for three hours. Mm -hmm. A week later, her mother calls and goes, "Sam, what did you do?" <laughs> you know, I said, "What? What? The phone bill? Did you see the phone bill?" And I went, "No, I didn't see the phone." She said, "Clarence is gonna kill me." <laughs> I never knew what the bill was. She never did tell me, but she was. I mean, she was scared. She was afraid of what your dad was gonna do. I had no idea it was. I was racking up, I don't know, back then, 20 bucks a minute. I don't know. Right. <laughs> you know, it might have been a $2,000 phone bill. Because <laughs> I was calling everybody. I was calling people I didn't like. <laughs> he, he took the, he, the car had this thing, because he used to go on the construction sites, and it had this really long bell that was like the horn, like three times the sound of the horn. I don't know what okay. it was. And like when Dad would leave the car, in case somebody called the phone, the car's like horn would go off really okay. loud. And I guess he had to deactivate it or something. And he had forgot to deactivate it. <laughs> he was in traffic and you know, he's driving. It's like bumper to bumper. And the uh, <laughs> phone goes, <laughs> Dad said he swerved and almost hit the car back, swerved back, oh, hit the car next to him. He said it scared the shit out of him. It's like 1968. I was 16 years old. Wow. It's 1968. How old are you, Uncle Sam? 62. I always remember your mother. She just called me in a panic. She called Granny and Granny says, Samia, nice. says, Samia, says, Samia yeah. Margaret wants to talk to you. <laughs> what do you want to talk to me for? What did you do with okay. the bloody phone in the car? Look, Clarence is going to kill me. They wanted to adopt a boy. His wife couldn't have kids, so they wanted to adopt a boy, and they adopted, Brian was eight years old, and when they did all the paperwork, and they went to this Catholic convent to pick him up, and uh, the day they were picking him up, he was, there were two little girls at the door, and they were crying, you know, at the window. And my aunt and uncle said, What's the story with them? They said, that's his sisters. And so they said, you know what? We don't, we're we not going to split them up. She said, we'll, we'll take all of them. Well, Uncle, Mom yeah. told me that uh, Uncle Jimmy didn't want. She, 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 like, she made sure that it was, she, like, insisted. And he yeah. was usually, like, the boss. And she yeah, insisted. But whatever, but they took them. I thought okay. that was just so... And, and uh, they took all three of the kids. Such a nice so, thing. So uh, Brian, when he got older, when he was 18, he went looking for his 
real parents because he was eight years old. I mean, he was mm -hmm. a, you know he knew his parents, and uh, he found where they were living and he knocked on the door and they're all sitting around and they were all drunk. And they said, "What do you want?" He said, "I'm Brian. I'm your son." They said, "We gave you up. We don't we don't want anything to do with you." Mm -hmm. And they told him to leave. And he came back, and a month later, he killed himself. Put a shotgun in his mouth. I went to the apartment. I had, ne I had never seen anything like that. The sofa and the wall was splattered in blood. Was he still there? No, they had taken the body away. But I went over and there and held my hand, get some of his stuff. And it was just the whole wall was just splattered in blood. I was uh, very close to Brian. He was not close to me because Aunt Agnes screwed up. She used to use me as an example for Brian. Whatever I did right, she would say, see, now see the way Sam does it. See? So he, the kid grew to hate me, you know. I used to go, why the hell does she do that? Why does she do that? I always remember her just all the things. She'd always like, hug that she hell was, out of She was, but she was, a terrible, she was terrible as far as... You know, child psychology. She never had kids, yeah. and so she didn't really know how to. She didn't show them that she loved them. She just was a disciplinarian and was good-hearted, but she never hugged them or kissed them or told them she loved them. Oh, any of that. I, was, I remember she was always hugging and kissing us. I yeah, remember not that. Her, not her own kids. They were all skilled tradesmen. They were all tool and die guys. They all had that trade. So, um, you know, Uncle, Uncle Jimmy went to work for GM and. Uncle Sam with Kelsey Hayes. Were the plants on the Winter, Windsor side? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there's the big uh, Windsor truck plant as well. The transmissions are pretty There used to be everything at Chrysler, Ford, GM. Are they all gone now? Yeah. They're still there, but they're not near yeah. what they used to be. Yeah. No production. The yeah. famous engine, too, the 351 Windsor. Yeah. Right? yeah. When I was 18, I got a job yeah. at Chrysler for the summer. And uh, it was the best thing in the world for it because I realized, boy, I could never work in an assembly line. My buddies all couldn't wait to go to finish school and go to work for the for the auto companies. I worked, there for, I worked there for two days. They gave me a job on the uh, putting brake fluid in the master cylinder. So this guy says, okay, here's what you do, and your car's coming along the line, and you, you come and you put this clamp on the master cylinder, and then there's these big buttons here. He says, you press the green one, and then when it's, when it's fill, hit the red one, take the clamp off, the car will move along, you know, and you slide a bar in, which would catch on the car, which would move you, you along with the car. Well, and he said, uh, you know, so you know what to do. So for like three hours, I'm sliding this out, you know, put the hand clamp on. All of a sudden, I get one where there's yellow light and it's flashing. He never told me what to do. So I'm trying to push a different buttons. Well, now I come to the end of you know, of my, my little station, I have to pull, they told me never shut the line down. They said, you'll lose your job right away if you sh shut the assembly line down. So I pull the bar out, just let the car go through. So I run up and I go to the next one because it's already moved down quite a bit. Slide the bar in, put the master cylinder thing on, put the brake fluid on, beep, beep, yellow light. Well, my machine was not pumping brake fluid anymore. That's what it was, but he never told me what to do. What you're supposed to do is you immediately, you've got this white chalk that's sitting there, you write, B, B, bad brakes, okay, on the windshield. I didn't know to do that. So I'm doing this, probably 50 cars, okay. And if you've ever seen, been in the car factories, when they get to the end of the line, they start them up, they got put it in gear and go, they lay rubber and get them out into the parking lot. Well, these guys are taking my car, so I'm going to hit the brake. And there was no brakes. Died. <laughs> there was no brakes. You kept your job? No, I you know I walked off the line. I walked off the line. What led you to furniture? Um, I went uh, I went to Sears. Sears had just built this big mall uh -huh. in in Windsor, a uh, brand new mall, and the anchor Devonshire. tenant. Devonshire. Yeah, Devonshire Mall. Right and the anchor tenant was Sears, and a buddy of mine had gone there. He worked there for six months, and they put him in the management training program, sent him up to Toronto, you know, and uh, there was a lot of opportunity. So I said, shit, I'll try it. So I went up there and. They put me in, uh, in the furniture department. <laughs> I told Mr. Jones, and he, Herb Jones was the personnel manager. I said, I don't know anything about furniture. He said, you'll learn. And he stuck me in there, and little did I know, he set that pattern for the rest of my life. And she looked like Queen Elizabeth then. You know, she got old, she'd carry a little purse, and she'd sit quite <laughs> the proper like this. And a uh, tiny little thing, you know. 
And so my sister Margaret and I, we stop at the duty free. We buy like three bottles of duty free whiskey, and we buy cigarettes. We're buying all this shit from the duty free. We put it in the trunk. We're not going to declare it, okay? We're heading back to Detroit because she's going to spend the weekend at their house. We get up to customs. Margaret's driving. I'm sitting in the passenger seat, and our mother's sitting in the back. And we get one of those cocky customs agents who says, uh, says, oh, what country? You know, Margaret and I you know, pull out our ID, looks at it, doesn't say anything, hands it back to you. What about you? My mother pulls out her passport, she hands it to him. He goes, what's this? She goes, I beg your pardon. <laughs> you heard me, what's this? She says, it's a British passport. She says, have you no fucking heard of that before? <laughs> she, she, she says, he says, what'd you say to me? She goes, it's a British passport. She says, I'm going to tell you something. That's the best passport in the world. She says, and I'm going to tell you something else in case you're not aware of it. That British passport, we used to own this fucking country. <laughs> <laughs> Margaret and I are sitting there going, Mom, Mom, please. We got all this whiskey in the trunk. Please shut up. We thought, all right, there, he's pulling us over for sure. He throws her passport back at her and says to Margaret, go ahead, <laughs> and let, let's just go. But Margaret, and I, when she starts this one, the moment she said, I beg your pardon, Margaret and I look at each other going, whoa, we're screwed. <laughs> we're screwed. <laughs> oh, man. What's the deal with Broadway and all that stuff? I've never, she said, you've never been to a play. I said, no, I haven't. The following week, she came to the house and she got me. They went to, I came, I don't even know the theater in Detroit. Fisher and we probably. saw and we saw a, a chorus line, and it was it blew me away. It absolutely blew me away. And she said, "Did you enjoy that?" And I said, "Oh boy, did I enjoy it!" So a month later, she took came and got me again, and she took me to see Equus, which is just two guys on a stage, talking. And uh, it's not for everybody, you know what I'm saying? It's yeah. And I. I was the first, when it was over, I was the first one out of my seat applauding these guys. And your mother looked at me and goes, did you really enjoy that? So, it was fantastic, Margaret. She, we went across the street and uh, she took me to some fancy place where we had dinner. And some of the people from the play were there. It was just, you know, it was my big sister, you know. I just wanted to know something. You want a goodbye? They said, oh yes, you want a goodbye. And I stood up, I said, goodbye. <laughs> Take your part. <laughs>